Welcome to Alabama Gristmill. Good to have you back. This is uh, your host, Mike Causey, with my co-host, Donna Causey. I am glad to be here today. It's a day with no rain. We've had so much here lately. It's nice to have it. <laughs> no joke. I mean, it's nice to see the sun. I didn't know that it was existing mm-hmm. in the wintertime. I know. It's sometimes it just, this, this winter has really been a lot of no sun here lately, it seems like. A lot of rain and no sun, so it's going to probably make for some really good-looking lawns and landscapes oh yeah spring. the flowers and all will be should be pretty because they're not dry anyway if they don't get up flooded too much that's the problem well what kind of story we got today what are we covering today uh historically kind of bringing out that maybe people might not have heard about or know about this one kind of attracted me because it was one of the first settlers who came to birmingham alabama and it's a description by him of what it was like you know we see how birmingham with a Tall skyscrapers in the buildings and everything. I mean, very well populated. Traffic. Traffic everywhere. and <laughs> Construction. And you know there were some houses on the hills and things like that. This is a little bit different version of it because it's the very beginning of it. You know, out Birmingham kind of started as a railroad place. It was a conjunction of railroads meeting and with the minerals and all that were here, it, that's how it grew. It didn't really get started. Well, and the and the railroads were pretty much the highways back then. I mean, that was the way you got around. Yeah, it kind of got a late start, too, because it, we're not talking about the early pioneer days. Alabama, in Alabama, Birmingham was founded in July 1871. That's a little bit later in time. There were other cities that we've kind of covered in the podcast. That, right. And on your site, you know, they were... More of the uh, government locations, the capital moved around. It was not Birmingham, right. things like that. Right. I mean, Alabama found, was founded kind of earlier, a lot earlier. I mean, well, of course, the bicentennial, you know, dates back to 1819. So you can see from 1819 to 1871, Birmingham still was not here yet. There was a little settlement around it was in the area of Elaton. but it was not really a city. So it's kind of new. It's past is a little bit more recent. Definitely changed a lot. Oh yes, it definitely changed I mean, a lot from, from nothing into to to the major metropolitan area that it is now. Yeah, um, it was, actually it was a merger of three pre-existing farm towns by an association of businessmen and financiers. Yes, and we've got as far as another in an earlier podcast, we've got a story about how uh, it was. <laughs> there was a talk of a river that flowed underneath Birmingham. If you want a little bit more history on Birmingham. You can go check that podcast out. And an, another one about uh, one of our more popular stories was the uh, Birmingham Zoo. Right. And what lies what lies beneath Birmingham Zoo. There are a lot of good stories about Birmingham. <laughs> but before we get into this one, I wanted to say, uh, like we always do, it's kind of our sponsorship as ourselves. That's <laughs> if right. You could, if, if you want to help our site out and uh, you know, help, help us support what we're doing here, you can always uh, become a patron at uh, on our website, alabampioneers.com, kind of our sister site to the podcast. And you go there, click the button, and subscribe to the site. I'm sorry I interrupted you, <laughs> which I do quite frequently. No, I was just going to mention the books, too. Those also help. Oh, yeah. We hadn't had mentioned the books in a while. I know you're working on some a few more. And uh, we, in addition to the uh, the books, which are the Alabama Footprints books that you can find on Alabama Pioneers, or you can find on, you can find on Amazon, you've also written some fiction books. Exactly. That you can, uh, that are, that are historical and they tie into Alabama, but also, you know, a lot of the uh, the uh, immigration coming over from in Europe and, you know, through the uh, Carolinas. Right. You can you can see all of them if you just type my name in Donna R. Causey on uh, Amazon dot com and it'll list all the books there for you. That supports this whole thing, too, you know. All of it, all of it goes back into helping keeping this going because we're trying uh, to get helps our research out. and all the. All the te- technical fees and costs and everything involved in well and running all this. But that being said, let's go ahead and get into the story. Uh, early Birmingham, uh, the days before uh, buildings and skyscrapers, more of the days of tents and uh, fields. Really, the site of Birmingham was more in the area of Eglinton, where Eglinton is now. And that was where the main settlement area was. And it, it's where the Alabama Great Southern Railroad crossed the South and North Alabama Railroad. Well, we're, we're, I guess to kind of clarify, just I want to jump in on it. Where, where is Elanton? It's in the western side of town, uh, western side of Birmingham. Western side of town? Yeah. Okay. It, if you know what kind of uh, where Arlington is, if you've ever visited the plantation Arlington, it's in that area. So you can kind of okay. 
That'll kind of give you an uh, idea. If you'll like step, to... I'll step back and let you tell us more about the story. <laughs> okay. Well, that does, that's important because people that don't live here would not know that. According to one of the first settlers, William H. Dobbins, who lived in the first tent, the first log cabin was erected on the railroad near what was called at the time the old Nixon House on First, first Avenue. It was used as a commissary department for the railroad. And the first house erected was erected by a major mayor, and it was built of rock from Highlands because they couldn't use, didn't have brick. It was not available at the time. They didn't have it in those days, so they used a lot of rock. We had rock around in a lot of places. And it, this house was on the corner of 19th and 1st Avenue. This story kind of attracted me because I, it was the first one, William H. Dobbins, who was, lived in the first tent. And he gave a really good description of what was going on. Dobbins built his cabin later on near the railroad on First Avenue. And then, like a lot of men, they came down here and they worked in, in the tents. And when they were able to establish themselves in some housing, they sent for their wives and family. And he sent for his wife from Pennsylvania because that's where he came from. In 1873, he bought a piece of land near Sloth's Furnace, later known as Eastside Gardens. In the 1870s, the land along the tracks was known as Railroad Reservation. This was before Birmingham was founded, so this, this was the name of it. Everything was centered around the Railroad Reservation, so it's actually named Railroad Reservation. Some people probably still have heard that term if they've studied much history about uh, Birmingham, Alabama. While the railroads were under construction, they had to have something to live in for the men, and they just used tents and converted boxcar to house the workers and temporary enterprises that were essential for them. Besides shelter, of course, they had to have food and other places like saloons around at the time for the workers. After the tracks were completed, adventurers and fortune seekers rushed into the emergency city and with the help and direction of Eglinton Land Company, the temporary shelters were replaced with permanent buildings. The railroad reservation is a plot of land. If you want to know how large it was, it was 1,000 feet wide by 4,780 feet long in the center of William Barker's original plat of the city of Birmingham. So if you get an original plat, you can see where it was located. When the town of Birmingham was organized, there was a discussion at the time what to name it, and all kinds of suggestions were made. And some decided Colonel Powell, who was head of the Ellington Land Company, which kind of developed Birmingham, should be named, should be honored. And it was suggested that they name it Powelton. Others wanted the name to be Milnerville or Morrisville, or Josiah Morris, Mr. Josiah Morris objected strongly to using those names. And looking out the window, he said there was a distinguished citizen who was a native of an adjoining town whose name would be particularly appropriate, and it should be named after Judge Mudd. And the town should be named Mudtown. So Birmingham almost got the name Mudtown, which would have been kind of interesting. After Judge Mudd, Judge Mudd was a really wonderful person and a really wonderful character, and they really... And they honored him. As a matter of fact, nothing could have suited the place more at that particular time because it was nothing but a mud field around the area because it was so much growth going on. The town just missed being called Mudtown by just a few votes. Instead, Birmingham was named after the seat of iron manufacture in England, which was Birmingham, England. So that's how Birmingham got its name, since iron was being manufactured at the time. The first building on the site was a small frame blacksmith shop. The first town lot sold was on the northeast corner of 19th Street and 2nd Avenue. It was 50 by 100 feet, and it was deeded to O.A. Johnson on October 26, 1871, for $75. Very inexpensive lot, considering what Birmingham is worth, that lot is worth today. The city of Birmingham was incorporated by the legislature on December 19, 1871, 
and the charter declared that all the territory within 3,000 feet of the Alabama and Chattanooga Railroad on each side of the same, extending from 26th Street in said city to the eastern boundary of the city of Ellington, is hereby declared to be within the limits of the said corporation. Well, that's how big Birmingham was at the time. In 1873, the young community was almost depopulated by an epidemic of cholera, and in the same year, its financial run was all but completely wiped out by the financial panic which began in New York on the famous Black Friday in September. The town's recovery from these two disasters was slow. During the succeeding 10 years, its promoters just struggled to try to keep it from going completely under. The market value of stock in the Ellington Land Company fell as low as 17 cents on the dollar of par value. There were several years practically with no sales of lots, and mounting in 1874 only to $7,955.83. If you can imagine that, here they were booming like crazy, and they just dropped completely. From 1873 to 1878, Inclusive, the aggregate sales of property mounted only to $55,516.70. That's the exact figure. They really were exact about that, not even an approximation. Five years later, the remarkable growth of the town had set in, and the value of the property transferred had increased proportionately. In 1883, Ellington Land Company paid their first dividend, so they were beginning to boom again. Almost before the building of the town of Birmingham had been commenced, the Ellington Land Company, with confidence in its future development, began the construction of a waterworks system to supply its needs. So that's kind of early in time. Work was started in November 1872 and continued through 1873 and 1874. So that's how old the waterworks system is in Birmingham. Some additions were made in later years. The source of the supply was Village Creek, which was two miles north of town. Birmingham is the only place in the world where all raw ingredients for steel, coal, limestone, and iron ore occur naturally within a 10-mile radius. And so it was quickly named the Magic City because of all this. Wow, I I didn't know that was the Magic City or from the reason for the Magic City name. That's interesting. That's right. It was growing so fast. It was magical, because, and then you know, right, and, and the st- and the cold still. And I guess my favorite thing to take away from it is the uh, the. It was almost named Mudtown. I know it. I enjoyed that. There's a story more about uh, Judge Mud on the website to tell you a little bit more about him. But I, when that is a real difference from Birmingham, I'm glad it wound up being Birmingham. It's, changed, it's definitely changed, grown a lot and changed a lot since those days. Well, I wonder what it would have been like if we had, if it had been named Mudtown, you know, I wonder if it had been well, it, changed it, the direction of it or yeah. anything. You, you wonder about it. It would have definitely changed some of the marketing of the city to, <laughs> to, for, for travel. Come, come visit Mudtown. Yeah. I know Judge Mudge was nice, but it's kind of, <laughs> Really respected and uh, had a wonderful character because that's to be thought of that way. Yes. But I'm glad it got well, named was, Birmingham. I guess we, we we thank the two people or two or three people that voted against it. Yeah, <laughs> I the, think so too. Changed the name to Birmingham. So, but it's uh, definitely grown into a great city, and uh, it's you know from I guess its early days. Even though it was a late bloomer in the uh, state of Alabama, yeah. as a city or late founded, being the late 1800s. If you ever get in, go into Birmingham, and, you know, just imagine what when you're going into the valley area, just take with your eyes, just imagine all tents <laughs> everywhere and log cabins. And uh, it's hard to imagine that was the way, to, how large it is today. Yeah, we do have some uh, of video, uh, not video, but film of Birmingham on the website. Not from the obviously eight, late oh, 1800s, no. <laughs> but later on in the, it's interesting to see those changes from that till now i mean and there was a lot of pollution in, oh, yeah. in, the, in the air on those uh, the clips that yeah, we this, have. The, the, the clips i think go back to 1937 so it's really interesting to see them on the website so be sure and look for them they're fun it's fun to reckon to see look for different buildings and see if they're still there too Definitely, it looks very hazy and smoggy in those, those films as i remember so i'm glad that's improved we did we were still producing a uh, city but it had a lot of consequences to it although still mills were going going strong back in the day a lot of people had asthma 
from it, you know. But, yeah, well, they brought a lot of a lot of uh, economic benefits to the area, but it has definitely caused some health issues. That's for sure. It did. So I was glad we're glad we kind of were able to tamp down on that and improve the the view and the look of Birmingham over the years. Yeah, we'll go ahead and wrap this episode up, and uh, we'll let uh, Red fully play us out. But if you like us, uh, share, uh, subscribe, and share, and all that good stuff. And if you want to get in contact us with us, it's always info at alabamapioneers dot com. And uh, with that, we'll see you next time. We'll see you next time. Bye bye.